uh, see a lot of familiar names on the uh, participants list, so I believe I probably know many of you, but just in case you don't know uh, who I am or who we are, um, Diana T. Myers and Associates DMA, we uh, provide uh, consulting services to DCD and to the two eastern and western uh, Pennsylvania balance of state continuums of care. Um, and uh, we are having a web webinar today uh, focused on the unsheltered point in time count that's coming up uh, very soon, later this month on the 27th. Um, before we get started, I wanted to just introduce also David Wethington from DCED who's on the line and he's going to be helping to facilitate this webinar as well. Um, and uh, he can sort of fill you in on some housekeeping related uh, things. If folks have questions, we really want this to be an opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, it's hard to have uh, the lines open the whole time in case somebody puts the phone on hold or if they're on a cell phone and there's background noise or whatever. Um, so uh, if you do have questions, please uh, utilize the functions that Dave is going to tell you about uh, and feel free to ask away. Hello, everybody. Um, as we mentioned, my name is David Wellington. If you don't know who I am already, I'm the PAHMIS administrator as well as the PAHMIS help desk. Um, I still have noticed that there are a couple folks that are um, that have not um, put in their access pin. If you don't put in your access pin, then you won't be able to ask a question um, over the phone, but you um, surely will be able to type into the chat box. Um, but if to ask a question or to get our attention, there under the participants window, there's a little hand that uh, if you hover over it, it says raise hand. Um, you click on that, and then that will alert us, and then we'll be able to uh, open up the open up your mic so that you can ask your question. All right. So go. And, oh. Go ahead, sorry. And no, if, go you're, ahead, if you would rather um, not be unmuted to ask a question, you can always um, type your question into the text box, and Dave will be uh, jumping in to alert me to any uh, questions that folks have posed, and, and we'll stop throughout the. Um, webinar to respond to questions. Okay, anything else, Dave? No, nope, we have about 27 attendees right now. So. Okay, great. Uh, for anybody who's on the line and knows that uh, somebody else um, uh, was looking to attend uh, but was not available during this time, uh, please know that the, the webinar uh, is being recorded and uh, Dave will make that recording available as soon as possible on the Pennsylvania COC website, which uh, the link will go over. It's at the, the end of the webinar. Um, also, uh, if, if folks were not planning on attending, but there's some part of today's um, webinar you think that they would benefit from, then please uh, also share that information with them as well. Uh, the, the PowerPoint that we're using today was the PowerPoint that was sent out with the uh, information to access the webinar. It's the uh, PowerPoint for um, county coordinators for the unsheltered count. Um, so you should already have a copy of this. If, if folks need a copy, you can obviously feel free to. Uh, I thought that was another phone number. Hello. I'm Hello. sorry. Somebody's. Hi. Um, are you joining the unsheltered webinar? Okay. Maybe that person found the mute. Okay. Um, so we're going to get go ahead and get started. Um, okay, so thank you for agreeing to be the county coordinator. The purpose of this uh, uh, presentation today is really to just go over the basic elements of the unsheltered pick count uh, and to review sort of the roles uh, about the pick count uh, for, uh, for the coordinator. Um, for folks who have been their county coordinator for a number of years, uh, there may not be a lot of information that's new to you in this. There may be some questions you have as to why certain things have been sort of restructured or changed in certain ways, and we're going to go over those. Obviously, if there was a question you had that I don't respond to by the end, uh, you can ask as well. Um, so what is the point in time count for anybody who's new? It's really a snapshot of the homeless population on a given night, um, everybody always complains, why do you set the date in the end of January? We have no control over that. It is dictated by HUD that the pit count must occur um, on a single uh, date and time 
uh, on during the last 10 days of January. Um, and so we usually choose ours uh, for the last, I don't know, five or six years to be the last Wednesday of the month of January. Um, so that means that our date is January 27th, 2016. And that we're going to go over what this means uh, multiple times through the webinar. But what it really means are the overnight hours from Wednesday night through Thursday morning. Um, so it means that, for example, for shelters, if somebody is staying in the shelter where they sleep on Wednesday night and wake up there Thursday morning, um, that is the period of time uh, from which we're, would, uh, which we're counting for the pick count. Um, for unshelter, which is the purpose of this webinar, it means where that individual will be sleeping during those same hours. So even though sheltered is not the, the focus of today's webinar, for folks who are only involved in the unsheltered count and they know something else happens but they're not really sure, we just wanted to quickly uh, cover the total pick count includes a sheltered component and an unsheltered component. The sheltered component um, counts households and programs that are dedicated programs for serving individuals or families experiencing homelessness. Um, and so by that, it means it implies that homelessness is a criteria that must be met in order for that person to be served in that program. Uh, in some cases, in some of our more uh, most rural counties, we may have uh, programs that are not um, you know, a, an emergency shelter program, but it's a, another type of program uh, that sets aside certain, a certain number of beds um, for homeless. Specifically, those beds are only available to homeless. In those cases, folks who are occupying those beds um, get counted as part of the sheltered count, too. Uh, but those, those are sort of more the exception to the rule. In general, the sheltered pet, pit count includes all emergency shelter programs, transitional housing programs, and safe haven programs. I just want to pause for a moment there to say, by safe haven, this really is speaking specifically to one program in Washington County and one program in Westmoreland County. Uh, this is not programs, uh, uh, this safe haven here is not meant to be a domestic violence program that serves as a safe haven. Uh, if a domestic violence program is an emergency shelter or a transitional housing program, uh, they are most likely already on our, our sheltered list, and they are included in the pick count, but that's not what's implied there by Safe Haven. Um, data is also collected from rapid rehousing programs and permanent supportive housing programs, um, but because those households are in permanent housing, they're no longer considered to be homeless. So those programs, even though we collect the number of people that were in each of those programs, we don't report demographic data, disability data, or anything else on the individuals there. Again, the purpose, th this, this webinar is really just going to focus from this point forward on the unsheltered component. So what is the unsheltered count? Um, it is a count of households in a public or private space not designated for or ordinarily used as a regular sleeping accommodation for human beings. That's a mouthful. Um, and so as part of that, volunteers obtain demographic information through short personal interviews, and we're going to go through that a little bit more. As I already mentioned, the pick count date is Wednesday the 27th, and that uh, means those specific hours. Um, I want to just pause for a moment to really focus on that note at the bottom. Note the date cannot be changed by one COC or a RAB. The entire COC must conduct the count on the same date. Um, this was an issue that came up last year. There were some, um, uh, there was bad weather in one particular uh, part of our, our, our COC and the COC wanted to move the count, understandably, to a different date. However, one of the requirements from HUD is that we have a consistent date across the entire COC. Um, so what I would ask is, um, I'm, I'm not an unreasonable human being, um, if there are issues, if there's bad weather, if something happens in your county uh, that would impact your unsheltered count on Wednesday night or Thursday, whenever it is you're planning on conducting it, and we're going to talk more about that, um, in, in the next few slides. Um, please contact me. Um, you can contact me uh, directly at my email, which is lee at, the rest of the email was on the first slide. We also have PA Homeless Count at dma-housing.com. You can contact me via that way. Uh, there's a couple phone numbers that you can reach folks in our office, but I would just say if there's any concern about actually conducting the count on the day that you have, have it planned, uh, to please talk to us so that we can sort of think through 
the best approach, uh, regardless of, of weather or anything else, um, unless there's a you know a, an unexpected snowstorm that blankets the entire state. Um, the entire again the entire COC has to conduct uh, the, their count asking about the same uh, date, so asking about that period of time on Wednesday night to Thursday morning. Um, so in the case of some kind of snow emergency, for example, if the count needed to take place on Friday, that wouldn't be a problem. We would just have to, again, talk to volunteers to make sure that they're asking people, where did you sleep on Wednesday? Remember, that's the night that we had that huge snowstorm, something like that. Um, so we would, I just would want to talk, talk you through that process of re- uh, planning or, or, or revising the uh, period of time where which you're actually conducting uh, the pick count. Okay, so where where do folks who are unsheltered, uh, where do we count folks who are unsheltered? Okay, so this may include streets, sidewalks, vehicles, parks, hunting cabins, tents, campgrounds, barns, truck stops, abandoned buildings, bus stations, transportation depots, chicken coops, railroad cars, storage units, lumber yards. Um, the list could probably be three times longer than that of the examples that I've heard um, over the years. Um, I actually, if you have sort of a unique situation that doesn't neatly fall into one of these categories or we haven't discussed it before, um, please, again, feel free to reach out to me. I actually got um, a couple of examples just this week uh, from somebody who is organizing the count in Wayne County. Um, and I wanted to just uh, stop for a moment and highlight those because I think they're really good examples of um, locations in a very rural area. Um, and I, to be honest, I'm not sure exactly how HUD is going to um, say, yes, we should count those or not. These are examples that I actually just submitted uh, to HUD for some input in terms of if these folks uh, should be counted or not. Um, so the, the folks that I'm going to mention were identified by the local area agency on aging, the AAA, and uh, as folks who may or may not be homeless and should be um, contacted and counted for the pick count. Um, one was an 82-year-old individual um, who was living in a car outside of her own home. Um, the home is filled with debris and mold. Um, there's another similar situation where um, – the person is sleeping outside of their own home due to structural issues. Um, it seems like this has been going on for some time because the individual had frostbite last year um, as a result of sleeping uh, in, in his car. Um, so those are, those are new. In general, yes, sleeping in a vehicle um, would absolutely be considered uh, unsheltered if somebody is living out of their car. The, the tricky part of this one is that the individual owns the home that they're sleeping in the driveway in front of. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure how uh, HUD, if, if that was going to count as unsheltered or not, since that person technically has, uh, uh, has their own shelter that they could go to. Um, in the past, HUD has made statements that, you know, uh, homes with, um, you know, out running water, for example, would still be considered um, a home where somebody could live and, and habitable. So therefore, you would not count that individual as unsheltered. Um, but in this case, I'm not really sure. So if you have um, a situation known that's very unique, either before the count or it comes to your attention after during the count and you want to talk to me about it afterwards, I would encourage you to do so so that everybody's clear about which folks should be counted or not counted. And I can provide some information once I hear back from HUD about th those uh, examples from Wayne County. Um, so where do we not count folks? Um, I'm going to just go through this list and then highlight a couple specifically. Um, if somebody is unsheltered, now again, we're specifically talking about unsheltered, um, that does not include hotels, motels, shelters, transitional housing programs, permanent supportive housing programs, jails or prisons, hospital emergency rooms, halfway houses, recovery houses, any type of residential or medical facility, um, youth in a foster care program or some other type of other home placement who uh, specifically are in the custody of the state, um, doubled up households, uh, et cetera. None of those locations would be considered to be an unsheltered uh, homeless location. Um, I want to specifically highlight uh, hotel motels and shelters and transitional housing programs, which are listed here. Um, again, the, the shelters will be counted through, and transitional housing programs will be counted through the sheltered count. 
The other thing I want to just point out is that the street-based, if you have if you've taken a chance to uh, to look at the interview forms uh, that were sent out, the form for the street-based count includes a category on the first page uh, under question two about sheltered locations. And it asks about an emergency shelter, and it also asks about a hotel, motel, um, rent a room. The reason that is there is that in some counties, um, we have, have learned over the years that if folks are identified as unsheltered, they may be offered transportation to an emergency shelter program or to a hotel motel that's covered through HAP funds or some, you know, a, a local faith-based organization um, or or some other charity. Um, when the, that happens, the, we we're asking you to note that on this form. Um, that individual will then be counted as sheltered, not unsheltered. Uh, but this is really just a way to make sure that we get their information. So, for example, if you take somebody to your local emergency shelter at midnight and the um, the uh, the program conducted their interviews at 8 p.m., that individual perhaps may not have otherwise been counted if it weren't for the unsheltered form indicating you took them to ABC shelter. Um, likewise, many times the folks that we find uh, have not gotten counted in the past are folks that have been identified and then offered um, a hotel room uh, on the pit night. Uh, and we want to make sure that those folks are also counted. Again, they're not counted as unsheltered. They would be counted as sheltered for the purposes of the pit count. Okay. I just want to pause for a minute to ask David if there's any questions that have come through thus far. I am not seeing any questions, nor does anybody have, any, have their hand raised. <clears throat> okay. If someone does have a quick question, they can raise their hand, and we can say that I'll unmute you. Nope. Okay. All right. Um, moving on, methods. Okay, so how is the, the unsheltered count conducted? I just want to encourage if this is, again, if you're a newbie to this process, um, you do not need to, to conduct uh, your count based on all of these methods. These are the methods that are available. We're going to talk over the, in the next couple slides in more in, uh, in depth about each of these options. Um, but you may conduct both a street-based count and a service-based count, but it is not uh, a requirement. These are just options that are available based on the number of volunteers you have, the capacity you have, et cetera. Uh, the kind of locations that you're focusing on that it would make sense one way or the other. Um, okay, so the, the types of, of methods that are available really are service-based count or a street-based count. There's many different types of street-based counts um, that can take place. One is called complete coverage, which basically, well, we'll get into the, the explanation of that in just a moment. Uh, known locations only, and then a combination of both complete coverage and known locations. Um, okay, so what is the street-based count? It's also sometimes called a public places count, and it's really conducted by, by walking and or driving through a community, seeking to identify individuals and families who may be homeless. Um, there's, as I mentioned already, there's three different types. So complete coverage is really an attempt to count unsheltered individuals all across your entire county um, or to cover entire portions of the county. Um, so complete really just it implies what it is. It means that every every part of your county or a particular city or borough within your county is being covered. Known locations only, um, that means that you're really going to either walk or drive to uh, locations where you believe uh, homeless may be uh, residing, where uh, you have uh, identified folks in the past um, or where it's the most likely that somebody who was unsheltered uh, would be located on that night. And then obviously combination of complete coverage and known locations is, is a combination of both. It's, it's sort of canvassing perhaps a large portion of the county or a portion of the county uh, and then specifically going to those locations that you believe uh, are most likely to, to uh, have somebody unsheltered. I just want to point out here that there are two interview forms for the street-based count. Um, there is an interview form, uh, and then there is an observation form, uh, observation-only form. 
So when would you use an observation only form? If you are conducting uh, your count and someone is sleeping, for example, um, it's not recommended that you wake them up. Uh, that would be an example of when you would want to use the observation form. Um, similarly, if somebody does not want to be interviewed for any reason, um, that's fine. If you can just jot down on the observation form as much information as you can gather just based on that very brief interaction. Uh, another example may be if, some, if you can't safely access where somebody is. So for example, if there's an abandoned building, uh, we're not necessarily <laughs> encouraging anybody to uh, enter a, a potentially unsafe situation or structure. Um, and so that would be another example of uh, an appropriate time to use the observation only form. There's actually, in, in addition to that, there's a, um, uh, the street-based count. Uh, there's one for conducting it overnight on Wednesday night, and then there is another version, slightly altered version, that is for conducting the count during the day on Thursday or Thursday night. There have been a couple people who indicated that they want they they need to conduct their their unsheltered count during the daytime hours versus the night. And so if you your county falls into one of those uh one of those please please know that there is a form specifically for you saying uh to to be used on Thursday. Okay. Street base count. Okay, so this goes to the point I was just making. Um, if you are conducting your count overnight Wednesday, you will ask, where are you sleeping tonight? If you are doing your count on Thursday, you will say, where did you sleep last night? Pretty simple because, again, regardless of the date that the count actually takes place, we're asking about that period of time from Wednesday night, the 27th, through Thursday morning. Okay, moving on to the service-based count. This is one of those that has really taken off in the last few years. They used to be that we only had a very small number of counties that focused on a that utilized a service-based count, and now we have um, a pretty significant number of counties that conduct their pit count, their unsheltered pit count uh, this way. It's really where uh, the service-based count is really when you have staff or volunteers. Um, sort of set up shop and interview uh, folks who are utilizing the services of a particular program. Uh, it commonly includes soup kitchens, community meals, um, food pantries, benefit offices, veteran centers, and other mainstream social service programs. Um, there's a separate interview form specifically for the service-based count. Um, some counties also have, have chosen to do both a, uh, a street-based count as well as a service-based count just to make sure uh, that there are, there's an opportunity to identify and engage as many people as possible who could be potentially um, unsheltered and homeless. Okay, um, again, for the service-based count, this is something we've gotten a lot of questions for, and this is, we're, I'm gonna go over sort of the re rationale behind this in, in a few slides. Um, but if you are conducting a service-based count, that must happen the day after. So you can't ask during the day on Wednesday, um, where will you be sleeping tonight of somebody at 11 o'clock in the morning because any number of things can occur um, or uh, opportunities to come indoors uh, may present themselves during that day. And if we are doing it in that case, it may be that somebody who would have otherwise been counted as unsheltered is not actually unsheltered on that night. So as a result, uh, the service-based count must occur on Thursday, January 28th, asking where did you sleep last night, and that language is reflected uh, on the forms. I just want to um, emphasize to folks, I, I sent out PDF versions of the forms. I do have the Word versions. I purposely did not send them out for folks to make adjustments to, only because uh, in order to make the formatting work, um, it's, a, it's a bit touchy. And so sometimes the, the most insignificant change on the form throws everything off by a page. Um, and so if you have a very specific situation, if the forms that, that have been uh, made available uh, to date don't meet the, the needs in terms of how you're structuring your account, again, please get in touch with me and I can make a very minor adjustment to a form to say last night, tonight, whatever it is, based on the circumstances, we can discuss them and I can make an adjustment and send you specifically a form uh, to meet your need. Um, so please feel free to reach out to me for that information if you need it. 
Okay, again, who, who are we counting? We're counting basically everybody that you find, we're counting, um, regardless of, of what their household configuration looks like, regardless of how many people are in their household, et cetera. We're counting families with children, couples, married or unmarried, either way. Um, single individuals, we're counting youth, which we're going to talk a little bit about in the next couple of slides. Um, youth are persons under 18 and age 18 to 24. Um, we're going to be counting unaccompanied youth, parenting youth, everything. You don't need to know what all these different uh, categories are. We put uh, folks in these various categories uh, as we go through the forms and, and begin uh, compiling the data, um, but this is just to sort of again, emphasize that every household that you identify as unsheltered should be counted. Um, one specific thing that I want to clarify that um, has sort of been less uh, than clear in previous years um, from our office and from HUD uh, is who, who, who should you really count together? Um, and HUD recently uh, released some language around who is a family and basically any group of people who are residing together as a family or as a household um, should be counted together. So if you've got, you know, three siblings who are all traveling together, you can fill out one form and enter the data on all three of those individuals together. Similarly, if you've got um, any, any configuration of folks who consider themselves to be a household or a family, um, regardless of gender, regardless of any other circumstances, um, whether they have children or not, you can consider them to be a family and complete one form if they are identifying as a family or, or one single household. Dave, any any questions or hands? Uh, no questions right now. Okay, great. So what data are we collecting? Um, couple things I want to say, the, the, over the last couple of days I've gotten a few questions um, about the new chronic homeless definition um, and uh, need not, you need not worry, uh, the new definition, the, the questions that uh, need to be asked for us to count folks um, based on the new definition, uh, they are in this year's form, uh, that was part of the delay in terms of getting the form out to folks and in terms of getting all of the information just in general out to folks to make sure uh, that we had uh, the, the questions that we really believed were going to most accurately identify folks who may be chronically homeless based on the new definition. If you don't know about the new definition and you want more information, um, let me know. We put together sort of a fact sheet or a couple page just policy paper to uh, explain the new definition. Uh, HUD is also hosting a number of webinars, uh, and those are being uh, recorded and made available uh, online if you miss the actual webinar date. Um, but for the purpose of this, uh, the PIT count, you don't actually have to know or understand the, cr the new chronic definition. Um, you just will need to be asking the, pr the questions that are on the form. Um, so with that, what do we count? We count the number of people in each household. We need to know the age of each person in each household as well as their, their gender, ethnicity, and race. Uh, additional information that we look at are the number of episodes uh, of homelessness uh, somebody has uh, um, experienced, the length of time uh, in terms of the number of months uh, that folks have been homeless, um, their disability, there's questions around disability on that, which we're going to talk a little bit more in the next slide. Um, veteran status and domestic violence. So these are all, this is basically the, a summary of all of the data uh, that is examined. The, I mentioned already the new chronic definition. Those uh, questions around the number of homeless episodes and the length of time uh, homeless, those are, are those questions that have been revised to be compliant with the new definition. Uh, and there, I believe the, the actual survey, the interview form has enough prompts there uh, to guide you through that. But if there's any uncertainty or any questions that you have uh, before you meet with your volunteers to do the training, please feel free, uh, again, to reach out to our office uh, with any questions. Okay, so disability. A um, couple things that HUD um, wants to, to make sure communities know and are aware of. Uh, for the purposes of collecting data regarding disability status, 
um, COCs must ensure a couple different things. One, that volunteers administering the survey know that these questions must be asked of all persons being surveyed, and it is completely voluntary whether persons respond to questions about disability status. So what does that mean? It really means that you can't assume um, who is going to fall into a particular disability category or not. If you're, uh, you know, please ask all questions of all folks who are, uh, who have agreed to take the interview form to participate and be interviewed uh, versus, you know, making some sort of decision uh, that this person doesn't look like they have a disability and therefore you're not going to ask those questions. Um, next, that persons being surveyed are informed prior to responding to any disability question that their response is voluntary and their refusal uh, to respond will not result in denial of service. Um, it says the, the sort of in introductions, the instructions at the front of the pick count page really talk to folks uh, about their information being uh, confidential, that we're just asking some, some specific questions. Um, and I think that just to, to make that statement sort of a, a blanket statement at the beginning of the interview um, is, a, is a good thing to do, that this, this information is confidential. It's not going to guarantee any services. Um, we just need to collect this information uh, from you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, next, no questions uh, should be posed regarding the nature or severity of the person's disability. So this is a question that at least one person or several people ask every year um, if, if they're not sure if somebody has a disability or not. Um, if you're, whatever the, the, the answer is to the particular question, yes or no, um, it, the, the only thing I can say is to, if some, somebody is not clear about whether or not they have a disability, is just to ask the question. So does that mean yes, you would consider that to be a disability or no, versus asking any type of probing questions um, about the nature or severity, again, of their disability? Okay, I mentioned that we were going to talk about use. Again, you're not going to need to put folks in any sort of categories in terms of use or not use. This is just something that um, it, more of an educational opportunity with this. There's been a major focus um, by HUD um, to look at youth homelessness and to really understand youth homelessness. Youth homeless are, are um, believed to be undercounted in the pit count um, and uh, Beyond that, there has been a lot of conversation uh, around best I practices for identifying, for preventing, and for ending youth homelessness, uh, along with the opening doors goals as the federal strategic plan to end homelessness uh, among youth by 2020. So this has been a real big focus for um, of HUDs for the last year or so. And so I wanted to just quickly cover uh, when the word youth is used, what that actually means. So in general, youth implies a person under the age of 25. That includes children under 18 as well as young adults um, 18 to 24. So another sort of phrase that HUD has been using more regularly uh, is parenting youth, which implies it's a youth, therefore under 25, who identifies as the parent or legal guardian or one, of one or more children who are present with or sleeping in the same place as that youth parent. Um, if it's a parenting youth type of household, it implies also that there is nobody over the age of 24 uh, as, who is part of that household. Again, unaccompanied youth, that implies that somebody is under age 25. Uh, in the past, HUD used to call uh, children who were 18, under 18 unaccompanied children. Now everybody is being sort of categorized as unaccompanied youth, and then that data is reported to HUD on our end. Uh, based on of those unaccompanied youth, for example, who is under 18 and who is 18 to 24. Okay, so I mentioned that um, youth are believed to be sort of an underrepresented um, uh, population within the pit count. Um, there's some specific information that, that we have pulled together to provide folks on youth, um, some resources. One is uh, the booklet for the Unsheltered Count 2015. That's not a document that is updated every year. It's usually updated every other year. Um, I believe all the information is still relevant and up to date, um, but that is something that's on our website that has some information specific um, about counting youth. Um, also, it includes some recommendations for outreach. That document includes 
um, a list of, of youth contacts by county if there, if there are uh, county contacts that have been identified, uh, which every county does not necessarily have somebody who has been identified as a contact, uh, a list of other resources uh, that may include other social service type organizations or advocacy organizations that are serving youth. Um, and the other thing I wanted to just uh, share is that a few years ago uh, we did a webinar uh, on outreach and engagement of youth for the PIC count. Uh, this webinar was done by myself and Shane Burroughs from Valley Youth House. Uh, and if you have, if you weren't, if you didn't listen to this when it took place a, a couple years ago, uh, and you haven't listened to it yet, uh, I would really encourage you to do so. Shane is a, um, a dedicated uh, street outreach person for Valley Youth House, and he works in the in the Lehigh Valley. And it's fabulous, um, and he has. I think a lot of insight to share about not only youth, but the practices that he talks about are really relevant to any population uh, uh, within the unsheltered pit count. Okay, next population I wanted to quickly talk about was veterans. Again, uh, there's been a major focus on ending veterans' homelessness. Um, this has been a goal set by the U.S. Interagency Council, the Federal Strategic Plan, which I just mentioned for youth. They set a goal of ending veterans' homelessness by December 31st, 2015. Many continuums of care across the country have announced an end to veterans' homelessness. Um, our continuums of care have not to date, but this is something that we continue to work on. Um, for the purposes of the pick count, a couple things you need to know. Uh, uh, a veteran is identified as someone who has served in the U.S. Armed Forces or activated into active duty as a member of the National Guard or as a reservist. So both of those are important to know and the, the distinction or the, the important point I wanna make here is that some veterans have been told that they're not eligible for veterans uh, benefits or something like that because they are a were dishonorably uh, discharged uh, or some other type of, of situation. Regardless of that, if somebody answers yes to these questions that are in the, the um, uh, interview forms for unsheltered, they will be counted as a veteran. You don't have to be eligible for veteran benefits to be counted as a veteran for the purposes of the pit count. This is not about eligibility. It's really about just collecting demographic information. Um, similarly to the youth, there, there's a section of our unsheltered count booklet um, focused on homeless veterans and uh, contacts to reach out to if you haven't already made those contacts and connections and relationships with veteran serving organizations. Um, every county in, in our balance of state COCs is, is served by at least one, in some counties, multiple um, SSVF providers. That stands for so, uh, Supportive Services for Veteran Families. Um, they have dedicated outreach uh, folks who are probably in your county a lot, uh, looking to uh, identify and engage with homeless veterans. Um, if you don't already have relationships with these folks, they would be a great person to contact as soon as possible um, regarding, uh, you know, coordination for the pit count. Um, another good option is to coordinate with veterans who ha are either currently or formerly homeless to identify um, locations and to uh, perhaps participate uh, during the unsheltered count as well. Okay, so uh, I mentioned at the very beginning that there have been some changes over the last year or so uh, to the PIC count and, and for example saying that the uh, service-based count needed to take place the next day. So all of the, the basis for, for any sort of changes that have been made um, came from HUD's point in time methodology guide, uh, which was put out uh, right before the 2015 count, uh, late in 2014. Uh, there's been a couple of modifications, uh, but this, this 2016 count is the first year that uh, we're being held to the methodology requirements outlined in this guide. Um, I'm not suggesting that you have to go and read the guide. The guide includes 14 standards. I will tell you that our office has read the guide. And the, the, the information that we present today, the way that our, our forms are um, structured and, and developed, um, as well as other guidance that we put out is all, the, the basis of that is in order to be compliant with HUD's methodology requirements. 
A um, couple, I want to just highlight a few of the standards so that, again, so that folks understand sort of the, the logic about some of the requirements. One, standard number nine, uh, COCs must account for and report on all unsheltered homeless people residing in the COC's geography. Uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, we need a contact person, for example, for every county, um, that we are still missing some contacts in certain counties. So if you are uh, a neighbor to one of these counties, you may hear from us saying, we don't have somebody for one of your neighboring counties. Do you know of anybody there who would be a good contact person for us? Um, so that's just something to make you aware of. So how do we make sure that we um, meet this standard? The count is carried out by knowledgeable people, which is all of you. Um, there's local teams that exist to uh, plan and coordinate the count, and we use uniform reporting tools across the entire COC. Uh, another standard to highlight is uh, standard 10. Uh, COCs may exclude geographic areas where the COC has determined that there are no unsheltered homeless people, including areas that are uninhabitable. The example that HUD uses in their, in their uh, methodology guide includes, for example, deserts. Uh, COCs must document the criteria and decision-making process used to identify and exclude specific geographic areas. So uh, as the, the little stars down there at the bottom this, uh, indicate, this corresponds to a question on the unsheltered county summary form. Uh, a couple people have, have reached out to me to ask, where is the 2016 county summary form? And I promise to you, it, you will have it next week. Uh, I, again, we've had some delays re related to uh, changes to the forms we needed to make for the chronic uh, question and other things. So I promise you, you will have this next week if you're looking for it. This is something that's filled out after the PIT count. So um, it, it, there's no delay on that end. It's just making sure that you understand what's going to be asked of you. So we will get it to you as soon as possible. Um, okay, so how do we meet these standards? We have outreach to uh, identify places to canvas. Folks uh, in, in each county uh, go about this very different ways, but in some cases uh, th there's uh, discussion with individuals who are currently or formerly homeless to identify places that should be um, hit during the pick count. Uh, there's conversation with state uh, forestry folks, with local police, with highway patrol, public libraries, et cetera. There's coordination that exists already within the PATH programs as well as um, SSVF. Um, places may be excluded from canvassing if it is known that there are no homeless people or if locations are not safe to access. Again, just explain that in the summary form. The, the reality is, is that on the eastern half of the state, there are 33 counties that um, make up about 21,000 square miles of space, and in the west, there's 20 counties for over 15,000 square miles. It, HUD, by no shape or form, is expecting that we're going to cover, uh, you know, 36,000 square miles as part of our, our unsheltered pig count, but we just need to be able to explain to them in the COC application that's submitted every year uh, what parts of the COC uh, were not canvassed and why. Okay. Next standard, standard 11, COCs must be able to verify that the unsheltered homeless people identified in the count are unsheltered on the night designated for the count as defined by 24 CFR 589.3, which we have already discussed in terms of which, uh, which um, count, um, locations are included uh, in that definition. So how is that done? Again, pick count forms include specific nighttime locations. A location is noted for each person so that we can verify that, in fact, that individual or that household was unsheltered in an unsheltered location that night, and every form is checked to verify uh, that it's an unsheltered uh, location. Standard 12, COCs must ensure that during the pit count, homeless persons are only counted once, it is critical that the counting methods be coordinated to ensure that there is no double counting. Therefore, COCs must also collect sufficient information to be able to reliably deduplicate the pit count. Um, so this is something that, that our office um, takes very seriously and ensures that we do. We have to report, again, when we uh, submit this data to HUD, we have to sort of explain and verify our 
our methodology, our data quality, et cetera. And this is one of those things that we always make sure that, that uh, we, we check. So how is this done? Count is conducted, again, covering the same time period of time throughout the whole COC. Um, so that the, the assumption is that if somebody were to move from point A to point B uh, from a neighboring county, I know, for example, in Bethlehem, it covers Lehigh and uh, Northampton counties. If somebody were counted perhaps in both, this would give us an opportunity to identify uh, that that person uh, uh, you know, could be a duplicate. For that reason, all persons are asked if they have already been interviewed, and hopefully if they say yes, somebody will not interview them again. Um, the count forms include descriptive information, including initials, age, gender, race, number in households, et cetera. We don't ask for social security number. That's explained in the instructions or the introduction on each form as well. And as I said, we, we check for duplication uh, as well. Okay, we're getting down to the wire, folks. I know this is um, uh, a bit long here. So standard 13 and 14, I just wanna Again, I think these are the last couple to highlight. Um, surveys of people for the sheltered or unsheltered count must be administered in a manner that protects participant privacy and safety, as well as the safety of the person completing the survey. That's 13 and 14 states. COCs are required to ensure that people conducting the PIC count, including project staff and community volunteers, are appropriately trained about PIC count standards data collection procedures, and protocols for privacy, security, and personal safety. A uh, couple things I wanna say about that, that, that last slide. Um, one is that locally, you know, I, I, I hope that folks are having a conversation uh, about safety and where folks should or should not go if you know that there are certain parts of your uh, community that, that are not appropriate necessarily to send volunteers into. Um, and secondly, uh, last year we provided um, a, a slide, uh, a PowerPoint slide along with a script uh, for county coordinators to use for volunteers. Uh, that revised for 2016. Uh, there's only uh, some slight modifications that are needed, um, but I know folks are working on setting their dates or in many cases already have their dates when they're gonna be training volunteers. Um, you will have that at the beginning of next week. Uh, if that does not work for your time uh, line, please let me know, and uh, I can let you know if there are any specific things from the 2015 uh, PowerPoint that are gonna be changed, what, what those, those uh, uh, specific slides are. Um, additionally, if you, one of the, the questions that we ask on, um, on the unsheltered summary form is if you have any sort of comments or, or uh, about the training, uh, to please let us know. We, th we, this is done so that we can ensure that volunteers across the COC have a basic level of, of understanding and training. It's not in depth. Um, it's not meant to include every detail they need to know about the pick count. The assumption is that there is local information that will be added to the, pit, to the PowerPoint that we provide. Um, but if there are comments or if you have any thoughts about ways that that document or those resources can be made uh, modified to be more useful, please please let us know that information on your unsheltered uh, summary form. Uh, we want we we want to make sure that the uh, resources that we're providing um, meet your needs. Okay, making it happen. Actually, before I start, David, are there any questions that have been submitted? No, there are not. Okay, it's right after remember lunch, folks, so hopefully, sorry, what's that? We, remember folks, if you do want to ask a question, there's the uh, hand in the bottom left-hand corner um, of that side window um, that you can select to uh, acknowledge that you have a question. Thank you. Okay. Um, making it happen, the role of the county coordinator, again, most of you, um, have done this uh, at least once, but many times. Um, and uh, I, I recognize that most of you began preparing for your pig count in some way, shape, or form months ago. This, this next couple slides are really uh, there for those folks who have been newly drafted or are new to this process um, for whatever reason. Um, so the role of the county coordinator establish a committee of volunteers, select a method of conducting the, the count 
based on local capacity, whether that be a street-based count, a service-based count, or a combination of methods. Some folks have over 100 volunteers and they canvass enormous areas of their county. Um, some folks uh, send letters out to service providers uh, and uh, work with local police because that is all the capacity that they have in their county to be able to conduct the count. Um, it varies, and if you have any questions in terms of what capacity you have available and the best way uh, to structure a count to make sure that you are, you know, including as many people as possible, even with limited capacity, um, you know, please, again, feel free to, to be in touch uh, with our office. Role of the county coordinator. Okay, so volunteer training, again, I, I you will have the PowerPoint from us uh, early next week. Um, this is something that's required by HUD to make sure that there is you know, some basic consistent information that's made available to all volunteers. Um, it may be done immediately prior to the count. I know that's the way a lot of folks do it, meet at this location at seven o'clock and we're gonna go through you know, a couple dozen slides, give you some coffee and send you out. Um, that is a, a great way to, uh, to organize this to make sure all people have uh, the important things uh, fresh in their mind uh, related to the count. Uh, PowerPoint training um, slides on the DMA website or the COC website. Um, once those are available, we, I will send them today so they can be uploaded to the COC website and we're gonna go over that at the very end as I mentioned. Okay, tasks of the committee may include, these are not things that you have to do, these are just examples of things that, um, uh, tasks that, that committee, that we've heard over the years that folks have done in their counties. Outreach to youth serving organizations, veteran serving organizations, notification of police, making sure folks know that, you know, they may see folks in the middle of the night with flashlights walking around, that's always a good thing to do. Um, publicize the uh, pick count uh, in local media, um, volunteer recruiting, determining volunteer assignments, and soliciting donations for incentive care package. Again, I know that for those of you um, who have done this many times, you have probably have either already done or completed these tasks um, uh, or prior to uh, today's conversation. So um, this is not new information, I think, for a lot of folks. Uh, additional uh, tasks may include assembling incentive care packages. Again, not a requirement. I know that a lot of people do collect socks, food, um, shampoo, various types of products that they, they give out during the pick count. And it's a great way really to increase knowledge of uh, unsheltered homelessness and awareness of that population in your county for folks who, who are doing sort of some type of donation drive to collect that information. Um, developing a transportation plan, making sure that if you are going to uh, offer folks hotel, motel vouchers uh, or any type of transportation to emergency shelter, uh, that everybody is clear on that process. If you have one van that will sort of be on call and move throughout the county to transport people, folks need to know that before they put somebody in their car. Or if it's fine for them to put somebody in the car, that needs to be known as well. Um, collecting supplies, clipboards, pens, flashlights, et cetera, ensuring there are sufficient copies of the interview and observation forms, Dro um, designating a drop-off location or a person so that we make sure that all interview forms and observation forms are collected. I can't tell you how important that one is. Um, every year we, we get uh, uh, emails and phone calls from people saying, I know I missed the deadline, but I'm trying to track down all of my interview forms. Um, so please make sure that this is discussed ahead of time um, so that that doesn't happen. We want to make sure that, that if, if folks have taken the time to come out and, and volunteer for this and folks have given of their time to be interviewed, that we've got uh, all of the information that's been collected. Also, I just want to say in terms of making copies of the interview forms, I've already heard from a couple people, the form is longer. I know the form is longer. Um, if, if, there, if there's not a question on the summary form for you to respond to the form, um, please feel free to just write me a note. If you have any comments about the interview form, we had to, again, we had to restructure the form based on some questions for the new chronic definition, which made the spacing not work. 
Um, and previously we got comments that the form was too small, that the font was too small, that it was too hard to record information. So we use this as an opportunity to make the font larger and, and have it uh, better spacing. Um, but if, if the length of the form is an issue, uh, please let us know and we will do what we can if that seems to be the majority opinion there. Okay, um, things that we just want to ask that you make sure about is safety, ensuring that everybody who is participating in your uh, account, is, all volunteers are safe. Um, anonymity, you know, this can be an invasive process. We're walking up to where somebody is is, is sleeping uh, or plans to be sleeping for the night to ask them personal questions. Um, so to the degree that you can sort of guide your volunteers on the best ways to make folks, uh, you know, uh, at ease and feel more most comfortable uh, and that their information is private and confidential, I think really just helps benefit the whole process in general. Um, we want to make sure that the information collected is complete, that each person, again, each person is counted and only counted once. So if somebody says that they have completed the interview form with somebody else, um, please know you don't need to uh, also ask them the questions. Um, so additional information after the count, um, please complete the summary form coming to you next week. Submit all the information that includes all the interview forms and summary forms, et cetera. Uh, the date we're asking you to submit that is February 10th. Um, if you, for one reason or another, uh, cannot meet that deadline, please feel free to get in touch with us and um, we, we can discuss it and, and be flexible to, to some degree if needed. That doesn't mean everybody should call us and say we don't like the deadline. Uh, last slide, uh, resources. So again, on our website we have a number of different things that 2015 booklet, that will not be updated for this year. It's as up to date as it needs to be for the purposes of this year's count. Um, the interview forms are there. The PowerPoint trainings for volunteers will be posted there. Um, the, this PowerPoint is already posted there. Uh, and then there's also the archive webinars that I mentioned. Uh, there's a, a webinar specifically for youth that I mentioned. There's also a webinar specifically talking about structuring um, a service-based uh, pit count, um, as well as, as other webinars over the years for the unsheltered count. Um, all of this information actually has been, it said when I sent this out, will be, but it has been uploaded to the COC website, and the link there is provided. If you haven't been to the Pennsylvania COC website, uh, you should go. There's a lot of information there. Um, but once you arrive at the website and you're on the home page, you can hover over uh, the tab on the menu that says Ending Homelessness, and then the first link under that will be 2016 PIT Count. Um, and that's where uh, you can find all of the PIT-related information um, to date. And additional forms will be loaded to that, uh, that spot including the forms for the sheltered count. So if you're waiting for those, those will be posted next week uh, at that website as well, as well as emailed out to every, every uh, program. So with that, um, any questions? Again, if anybody has any questions, Please raise your hand for that. But Lee, at this time, oh, wait, hold on. Uh, Chris Cassidy, I'm going to unmute you now. And you Hello. are unmuted. Okay, thanks. Um, Lee, this is just a quick question. Last year in the Bethlehem Emergency Shelter System, we went in and counted the people staying there as sheltered. And so the form that you just said that's going to be available next week, that's the one we use, right? Not the street based count. That is correct. Are you talking about okay. the, the, the Bethlehem churches? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That one um they that program will use the uh the shelter, the emergency shelter interview forms. Okay. Thanks. Yep, sure. Any other questions from anybody? Okay. Well, um, as we as we get closer to the pit date, if there um, are any questions that arise, please feel free to uh, contact our office. The number again was at the front of the the website. I think that number that's listed there goes directly to Karen Kispert in our office. 
Um, my number is the same as that number, but the last four digits are 5130. Uh, I know most of you on the call have any number of, uh, of ways of tracking us down, but um, feel free to reach out and let us know uh, what, what support you need to be able to successfully uh, carry out your count. So with that, if we don't have any questions, I, I think we can uh, call it a day. Yep. Okay. No thank you, everybody. Thanks, David. Yep. Thank you.